Hello. So, in this video we're going to be tackling something called indeterminate forms. So, we've seen in previous videos, right, we've been doing a bunch of limit computation bits. Uh, we developed these ideas of these rules of limits to break them apart so we could do, you know, products of limits and separate over terms and things. Uh, we even made some general sort of limit arguments along intuition about continuity, things like this. But as always, right, math classes, there's harder things to be looking at. So what if we have something kind of like this? So this limit, right, if we, if we sort of just naively plug in and see what happens, well, this first thing I have one divided by one minus x squared as, you know, one, you plug in for x squared, you get this thing that looks like one over zero, right? So we've sort of seen stuff like this before and how it can sort of blow up into a very large number, right? Because as, as we get something very close to one and then subtract one minus that thing, you get something very close to zero. Dividing by something really, really small makes it really, really big, right? So on the one hand, that piece, right, our, our piece over here, this piece is going to something infinitely large. But at the same time, if I plug one in over here in this other piece, I get something getting really, really small. It's going to zero, right? Because if I plug in one, I get one plus two minus three goes to zero. So on the one hand, I have this piece that's getting really, really large. On the other hand, I have this other piece that's getting really, really, really small, and I'm trying to multiply those things together. And this is gonna generate an issue, right? I can't split this up because I am having a uh, sort of non-defined piece here, right? I can't use my product rule. So what do we do? So this is sort of exactly the problem. This is, this is what we are talking about when we talk about indeterminate forms. So in general, um, indeterminate forms are these forms that generate sort of a tension between two competing pieces of a function, where you have sort of one of them trying to make the overall value infinitely large, like we saw before, right? One piece going to infinity, whereas the other piece is trying to make it arbitrarily small, right? It's trying to go to zero. And you have these two things sort of fighting each other and to see, you know, trying to figure out which one is going to win that battle, right? How, how do we figure out which one to use? So the one that we just looked at this piece, this would be an example of an indeterminate form called this sort of infinity times zero form, right? So this is one of, we will see many indeterminate forms, and it's coming from this idea that this first piece over here is trying to go to infinity, it's trying to get infinitely large, whereas the second piece is trying to go to zero, so it's getting in arbitrarily small. Now, it's really important. This is one of those things that's gonna sound like I'm just being pedantic, or I'm just being really nitpicky about wording, but it's actually really important to make a note here that this limit isn't actually something times zero, right? Because you, you hear that like, well, anything times zero is, is zero. And that's sort of true and sort of not true, depending on how nitpicky you wanna be about it. Um, but what's happening here, even though this is a infinity times zero form, that's what we call it, this thing, remember, is not actually zero when we're thinking about the limit, right? The limit goes to, it's, it's what it is approaching, but we're getting sort of very, very close to it without actually using that value. So there is an important distinction to make here between going to zero versus being zero. And this is something that will sort of crop up as we are tackling limits in the future. So to be very clear here, there needs to be something going to infinity times something going to zero, not something that is infinity, which wouldn't actually make sense because that's not a number, but also not something that is zero because again, that's, that's different, okay? So I, it's, a, it's a slight uh, nuance, but it turns out to be very important, okay? Now, if we sort of manipulate the expression a little, because it looks a little weird the way I have it written initially, we can actually get another indeterminate form. Um, so this one is the what's called zero over zero form, and it's it's the same thing. I've just sort of combined the two terms, right? So I multiplied this right hand side against the top over there, and got this new fun, uh, this new fraction. But this fraction is again, if we tried to plug in one, we get something going to zero on the top and something going to zero on the bottom. Um, which again, something going to zero. This is an important distinction. It's not actually zero. 
Um, so in this case then, this, this is another indeterminate form because the dividing by zero bit is trying to make something really large, but having the zero in the numerator is trying to make the thing really small. So you still have the same sort of tension, okay? So back to our original question, okay, great. It's an indeterminate form. What do we do, right? So fundamentally, if I'm thinking of it in this form, right, my fundamental problem is that I have a zero sort of occurring in the top and bottom, right? As I, as I try to plug in one, I get zero on the top and zero on the bottom. And if you remember for polynomials, the zeros coincide to factors. So what we want to do is start by trying to figure out where that factor is in both the top and bottom, and we do that by factoring. So our very first step is to factor apart this particular problem, right? So I factored the top into x plus one and x minus one, and the bottom I factored into x plus one and x minus one, and I factored out a negative to make it look a little bit more normal. Um, so to be clear, if I factor out a negative from here, it becomes x squared minus one all times negative ones. So that's, that's what happened here. Okay, now why do this? Well, if you if you take a look, right, now when I plug in one, I can see that the x plus three and the x plus one, those are fine, right? When I plug in one, I get nice non-zero numbers. It's this x minus one and x minus one that's causing me sort of a headache, right? But, and here is sort of a key reason why we care about the going to zero versus being zero, the limit doesn't care about the actual point. It cares what's nearby the point which means that we could actually eliminate those two factors, right? We could cancel the top and bottom. The function as a function that I get, right? Like this function here versus that function there, these things are not the same function. They're the same everywhere, but x equals one. But this limit specifically doesn't care about x equaling one just nearby one. That's why I can do this. And now this thing is nice and continuous at one. So now I can plug it in, right? So if I plug in one, I get this four over negative two which is indeed negative two, which we'll point out is not zero or infinity, right? One, the top was trying to make it go to zero, the bottom was trying to make it go to infinity, it actually went to negative two. Neither of those things, right? And this is why it's indeterminate, is that when you have an indeterminate form, it could literally be any real number, right? It could have been pi, it could have been 57. The only way to know is to do some sort of clever manipulation or technique in order to actually sort of eliminate the indeterminate bit and get our answer, okay? So one of the reasons why I'm, I've been stressing these indeterminate forms as this tension is that there are lots, which we're gonna go through here in a second, there are lots of forms that look indeterminate, but not all of them are. And it's sort of vastly easier to remember uh, or to think of indeterminate forms as being a tension and seeing if that tension exists. Does one thing try to make it really big while the other thing tries to make it really small? And that will help us determine whether or not it really is indeterminate. So. In this case here, we're looking at a form, and, and again, to be very clear, these are the forms, right? Like zero times infinity or zero over zero. I'm not claiming that you will have a function infinity over infinity, that would be crazy talk, which I spew plenty of, but <laughs> not in this case. So infinity over infinity, right? This form, we wanna ask ourselves, is part of this trying to make it infinitely large? Is part of this trying to make it infinitely small? If so, it's indeterminate, if not, it's not. But if we think about this, right, clearly the top bit is trying to make it infinitely large. I'm multiplying by something infinitely large, but the bottom is trying to split that up into infinitely many pieces, meaning I'm trying to make it as small as possible. So indeed I have this tension, which is why this piece is indeterminate, okay? Next up, we have this infinity over zero form. So we might look at this and say, okay, well, is again, a part of it trying to make it infinitely large and another part also trying to make it infinitely small or arbitrarily small, are we having that tension? So again, the top part is trying to make it infinitely large, right? Because I'm dividing, I'm uh, multiplying by something infinitely large and then dividing by zero, that's dividing by something very, very small. So that's also trying to make it infinitely large. So there's no tension. There's nothing trying to make this thing small. And so it is not indeterminate. Okay, so this is, the, this is the game that you wanna play when you're trying to decide whether or not something is an indeterminate form. If you can't you know, remember the indeterminate forms or if like me, you have a terrible memory and you don't wanna memorize these things, this is how you can tell, okay? So go through the rest of them here. So again, something on the top. So we have this zero over infinity. Zero here is trying to make it small and then dividing by something infinitely large, also trying to make it small. There's nothing trying to make it large 
So it's not indeterminate, okay? Zero over zero. So I have zero in the top. This thing is trying to make it small, but I'm dividing by zero and dividing by something really small tries to make it big. So now I have that tension, right? Something making it small, something making it big. So it is indeed indeterminate. All right, so now we get into kind of some weird stuff, right? So we have this one to the infinity. How do you see tension here, right? I'm not doing a fraction like we've seen thus far. But let's think about what it means when we have something of the form one to the to an infinity power, right? To an infinitely large power. So if I have something near one, but it isn't one, right? So if I have something, let's say, uh, like 0.9, right? And I keep multiplying it against itself. Well, if it's less than one, it's gonna get really, really, really small, right? So if I have something smaller than one, but I raise it to an infinite power, that sort of keeps making it smaller infinitely many times and it crushes it down to zero, right? So that's trying to make it really small. At the same time, if I had something slightly bigger than one, then like 1.1, something like that, then every time I multiply it against itself, it gets bigger. So if I do that infinitely many times, it's gonna blow up to infinity, right? So on the one sort of side, on the one hand, I have something crushing it down and making it small. On the other hand, I have something blowing it up and making it large. Again, I have this tension occurring between the two. So I have something really small, something really big. That's gonna give me an indeterminate form. Okay, how about zero to the infinity? So again, the same sort of idea that I wanna think about here. I wanna think, okay, if I have something close to zero, that means it's really, really small. And if I keep raising that to a larger and larger power, what happens? Well, it, it stays small, <laughs> right? Nothing's really trying to make it big here because the power is just making it even smaller. And if I wiggle around zero, right? If I pick something sort of near zero, it's still small. So nothing's trying to make this large. So this is indeed not an indeterminate form, okay? One to the zero. So the zeroth power is trying to make something small, right? It's trying to drag something down to one. One as a base is just what it is, right? It's not trying to make things infinitely large. It's not even really trying to make things infinitely small. It just sort of is what it is. Uh, so this, again, nothing's trying to make this large. This is not indeterminate infinity to the zero. So this one, um, again, is a little tricky because you typically hear, right, that like anything to the zeroth power is one. And again, that's sort of kind of true depending on how pedantic you wanna be about this. But the key here is that we don't actually have the zeroth power and we don't actually have infinity. We have things going to these values, right? So this base of infinity, I have something getting infinitely large. So the base of infinity is what's causing the increase. It's trying to make this overall thing huge. But the zeroth power is trying to push something down to one. It's trying to make it small. So again, we have this tension, big versus small. So this is gonna give you an indeterminate form, okay? Infinity to the one, well, the one power is not trying to make this thing small, right? So if I have something infinitely large, the infinity base, and I raise it to the one, it's still just infinitely large, which means it is not indeterminate, okay? And last but not least, infinity to the infinity. So the infinity base is trying to make things infinitely large. We've seen that with the infinity to the zero. The infinity power is trying to magnify this, right? It takes the, well, how, you know, whether it's getting big, it tries to make it bigger, smaller, it tries to make it smaller. In this case, you have the infinity power sort of just also trying to make this thing large. So this tells us that there's no tension. There's nothing making this small. So it's not indeterminate, okay? So this is sort of as a, as a quick note of this whole graph here um, or this table. There are lots of things that look indeterminate that are not indeterminate. And so if you try to memorize the form, it can be really easy to sort of mix them up, right? Because you may forget like, okay, I know like zero over zero and infinity over infinity, or was it infinity over zero? Or like there's some combination that are or aren't, right? So you, memorizing this, it makes for a lot of room for mistake. So that's why, as we sort of went through this, the idea was to think about the indeterminate forms as generating tension between these two pieces, right? You have a piece that's trying to make it large, you have a piece that's trying to make it small, and that tension is what makes this an indeterminate form. And so we have here um, the sort of classic indeterminants. Uh, 
in terms of sort of one piece. We did see earlier, right, that there was that infinity times zero was was uh, another indeterminate form, but we immediately rewrote that, right, as this um, zero over zero or infinity over infinity, depending on which one you're looking at. So these are the sort of indeterminate forms that you have or you can move stuff into, to be clear. Um, so again, in general, the way you want to think about indeterminate forms is being this tension. One thing trying to make it large, one thing trying to make it small, and that way you don't necessarily mix up when you're trying to remember the many forms that it can take. Okay, so that is that.